Well, today, one of our staff members is going to be preaching for us. Uh, Jesse uh, has been a true blessing. He and Brittany have been a blessing to Avalon Church. And uh, Jesse, believe it or not, has been here going on two years as our student pastor, as our youth pastor. And I do believe this. I believe God's hand is on him. I believe that it is a blessing of God that God has brought him to us. He is a very young man, but he has a very bright future, not only in ministry as a student pastor, but whatever God chooses to use him to do, I know without a doubt God's going to use him in a mighty, mighty way. And my prayer, and I believe that God is answering this prayer, my prayer is that God would use him to stir up our young people, to stir up our middle school and high schoolers, to stir up our parents, uh, to be able to impact this region for Jesus Christ. And I am very excited uh, today to be able to have him to speak for us. He has a very, very good message that I know you're going to be excited to hear. And uh, so let's give it up uh, for Jesse as he comes to speak for us today. All right. Thank you. Is this thing on? There we go. There we go. So I can't, I can't walk up here like a man like Phil. I got to use the stairs. But that was, that was pretty great. So good morning, everybody. How's everyone doing this morning? We doing good? Feeling alive on the 4th of July? Beautiful. Love it. Well, hey, it's been a while since I have been up here. I hope that wasn't on purpose, but um, I can tell you I'm excited to finally be back up here to be able to share the Word of God with everyone this morning. And I can tell you I truly am excited for what it is that God wants to say and what it is that God wants to speak, not just to me, but to everyone in this room this morning. And so I can tell you right off the bat, I, I do look a little different last time than when I was up here. And I'm not talking about when I was speaking. I was talking about a few weeks ago when I was doing announcements, my hair was so much longer and dyed green and I looked absolutely terrible. Um, and I finally was able to shave that this weekend. It was the greatest feeling in a long time, I can tell you that. Because I'm not, I'm not saying I'm ashamed of what I did. It was a great bet that I, I, I took part in to, to help bring students to our summer event, to help bring them to our D-Now. I said, if we can have this many students show up to our summer event, I'll let you guys dye my hair whatever color you want the following week. And they did not fail to disappoint with that. So I was finally able to cut it all off this week, and so I love that I was able to do that. But what was really interesting is that as much as I hated dyeing my hair and as much as I hated the feeling of really long hair, there were some people in my life who seemed to have hated it more even though they were not the ones who had to deal with it. And I can tell you right away, a lot of you are like, it's your wife. One of them, yes, that is not the main person I'm thinking of. Yes, Brittany absolutely hated the color of my hair and how long my hair was. I literally slept on the couch for the last month. No, that's not true. But it was an, <laughs> she, did, she had no problem telling me how much she hated the way my hair looked, especially when it grew out and it was half green, half really dark blonde. It looked absolutely terrible. But there was one specific person who made sure they told me every moment they saw me that I looked disgusting. And that one person is the one and only Justin McIntyre, ladies and gentlemen. Justin McIntyre, give it up. He, every day, I'm telling you, when I walked into this office, when I walked into this building, he would look at me, shake his head like a disappointed dad, and just go, man, you look ugly. Like, every time. Every time he saw me, he was like, are you going to shave this? Like, this is terrible. To the point where even at the end of last week, when we had some of our staff meetings together, I heard him talking with John, and he goes, you're going to make him cut his hair, right? Like, you're, you're, not, you're not letting them go on stage like this again and speak for 30 minutes with that type of hairdo, are you? And so, thankfully, I just took that as a note as we, we need to cut it now and this needs to happen before John is forced into a very awkward situation. So he didn't tell me I had to cut my hair, but I cut it for the sake of uh, Justin's feelings. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. It was, it was able to help me out a lot. Um, and so I can tell you, despite all that, I really am thankful and able to be able to teach what God has for us this morning. And I do want to say that as we were talking as a staff, as we were talking as pastors, what this would look like, we met together with me, Richie, John, and Justin. We talked about what is this summer going to look like? Who is going to speak? What are we going to speak on? And what is everything going to look like for, for the month of June and the month of July? And I can tell you, originally I was given the date to speak of June 27th. I was originally given last Sunday to speak. But John approached me and he said, hey, would you be able to switch with me so that you can take July 4th and I can take June 27th? Without even thinking about it, I was like, sure, no problem. I'll gladly, I'll gladly do that with you. 
And right away, I can tell you, right after that moment happened, almost every day after that, I would hear nonstop as I came to church and nonstop as I came to work, July 4th is one of the least attended Sundays of Avalon Church. And so immediately I was like, oh, he didn't pass this off to me because he had some schedule situations. This man went, oh, this is going to be how many people showing up? Give it to the rookie. So thank you for that. I'm just saying, I know, I know you may have had some schedule things pop up, but I'm just going to say, all I'm saying is praise God this is a day we celebrate freedom because I'm sure not feeling the love, all right? So I do, <laughs> that was stupid. All right, so I am, I am really thankful that we do have this opportunity to be able to speak this morning. And I can say that when I was given this opportunity, I was praying, what is it that God wants me to speak about today? I was a bit thrown off about what it is that I really feel like God wants me to speak about. Because when I was talking with Richie, when I was talking with some of our other pastors, I want us to know I was not given a specific topic that I had to talk about. I wasn't given a certain section of the Bible that I had to use. Like I was given free reign to talk about what it is that I believe God wanted me to talk about. And it's very interesting because I just wasn't expecting God to go the direction that he wanted it to go this morning. But the more and more I prayed about it and the more and more I thought about it, the more I really felt like God was leading me to speak and teach about this one basic point. And this one basic point that I believe God wanted me to speak on and teach about today honestly kind of seems like this would be the most selfish message that I could ever teach on on a Sunday morning. The message that I have is definitely one that I would not come up with on my own, but the more I prayed and the more I asked God, the more I believe this is what God wanted me to speak about. And so yes, this point may seem selfish from a certain perspective, but it is a point I believe God wants to speak to our pastors in this room and a point that I believe God wants to speak and use with the entire congregation here this morning. And the point that I believe God wants me to speak on this morning is simply this. Pray for your pastors. Pray for your pastors. This is a very simple and yet a very important point that cannot be overlooked by the church. It is a very crucial and very important point that I think cannot be overlooked by the church, but it is something in the same hand that I think is sadly often overlooked by the church. And what's so heartbreaking to me is the amount of pastors and the amount of churches that hold their pastor on a specific pedestal and go, they are one notch down from Jesus. They're just one level below God. So they have their life completely figured out. They are not human like me. So I'm going to pray for them when I have the time because that's just a cute thing to do rather than my pastor crucially needs my prayers on a daily basis because he leads the church that is in our community. It hurts me. It hurts me to know that there are people that think that there are pastors who just aren't on the same human level as everyone else, and we therefore do not need to be praying fervently for these people. And what's so heartbreaking to me is the amount of pastors in the past few years alone who have fallen away from ministry, or worse, fallen away from God and stayed in ministry, simply because the world was a bigger desire to them than God. It breaks my heart knowing that there are pastors in this world, there are pastors in this state, I bet, who have fallen away from the call that God has given to them solely because the ways of this world got to them and the church did not. And I can't help but think and ask the question, what would look different if the church prayed for them on a daily basis? What would look different? Would there be a whole lot less pastors who have given up on the ministry, who had given up on the call of God, who would continue to fight for their relationship with God and fight for their family's walk with God? Would there be a whole lot less of that in this country if we had churches who found it an honor and a responsibility to pray for their pastors rather than just a cute thing to do? And so just to prove the point and to show you how messed up this has been becoming. There have been three recent headlines that I want to share with you that have happened over the past three years alone that have gone viral on social media. They have gone viral throughout the news, and they have definitely been the talk of the town when these things occurred. They've definitely been the talk of the town when these things happened. 
In 2018, this was one of the biggest headlines that went around on social media. It was this. It was mega church pastor claims, your words control your life, not God's. 2020, celebrity pastor of many years fired for moral failure. 2019, preacher leads over 10,000 members to believe you don't need Jesus to achieve salvation. Friends, these are headlines that have been written about churches not just 100 or 50 years ago, but in the past three years alone. And again, I can't help but ask myself, are these congregations of these pastors praying fiercely for their pastors? Because how much of this could be avoided and how much of this would not be real if these people were continuing to pray for their pastors? And I know this is a question that cannot be answered today. I know this is a question that you cannot do the math of and say, well, God would have helped out in this situation had people been praying and he wouldn't have if they helped out in this situation. I know this isn't a mathematical issue that we can figure out, but it is a question that haunts me nonetheless, and I honestly hope it haunts you to an extent as well. Because these are just three headlines that have come out in the past three years alone. And some of you even knew who these pastors were about by just me reading the headline. And what I want to say is these are just the pastors who are famous enough to end up on the news. Imagine the amount who have fallen away and given up on the ministry that we don't hear about. Imagine the people who have given up on the call of God, who have given up on their walk with God, who have given up on the ministry that we have no idea about. And I know this is starting off in a sort of depressing tone, but I say all that to say this. Friends, we need to take seriously the responsibility of praying for our pastors. We need to take seriously the responsibility of praying for the leaders of our church. Because I can tell you all very personally, I would not be where I am today had it not been for the godly leaders, the pastors, and examples that God has placed in my life. I can tell you that right now. I would not be on this stage. I would not have the job that I have. I would not be where I am had it not been for the people and the leaders that God has placed in my life. As a matter of fact, I'm willing to bet everyone in this room would almost agree with me. I'm pretty sure everyone in this room would say, I would not be where I am today. I would not be sitting in the chair that I'm sitting in had it not been for the godly examples and the pastors that God has placed in my life. None of us in this room would be where we are without those specific people, which is why it is so important to pray for those people. Friends, it is so important to be praying for those people in our lives, and specifically our pastors. And I want to say this. I'm not just saying to pray for pastors. I know that is important. I'm not saying that isn't important. We definitely want to pray for pastors across the board, but specifically pray for your pastors. Pray for the people that lead your family. Pray for the people that shepherd your family children. Pray for the people that look over the souls of your city and your congregation because those people are important to you. Friends, I want to encourage you this morning, pray for Richie. Pray for John. Pray for Justin. And pray for myself. Because I can tell you, I work with all of them and trust me, they need it. All right? Bad. We all need it bad. And as funny as that may come across, I do want to say this is a true point nonetheless. Because I'm willing to bet there is not a pastor in this room who would say, I do not need the prayers of the church and I do not need the prayers of the congregation. I believe every pastor in this room with me this morning would agree, yes, we need and we continue to need you to pray for us and for our church that we may lead it to where God has called it to go. And that is why we need your prayers. Friends, we need you to continue to pray for us, to pray for your leaders of the church, and to pray for your pastors so that we may lead Avalon Church to where God wants it to go and nothing more and nothing less. Amen? Amen. 
So God, we come before you this morning and we thank you for your word. We thank you for what it is that you have for us today. And we just pray that as we continue to dive in to your word today, as we dive into what it is that you have to say, not just to the pastor, but to the congregation as a whole, God, I pray that you would speak what you want to speak, nothing more and nothing less. God, let your will be done throughout the rest of the service, throughout the rest of this day, throughout your congregation, through your pastors, and ultimately through your church. God, in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. And so I want to dive into the Bible this morning, and I want to say on behalf of the pastor, on behalf of the congregation, this is what we are going to be diving into the Bible to study. We're going to be seeing this morning passages that relate to the pastors and passages that relate to the congregation and how they make up the church and how that should therefore function. But I want to start off this morning with a passage that has terrified me ever since I knew God has called me to pastoral leadership. This is a passage that absolutely terrifies me, and I bet if you find any pastor inside or even outside of this room, you will find someone who this passage scares. And if it doesn't scare them, it should a little bit. And that passage is James chapter 3, verse 1, and it says this. It says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. We who judge will be judged with greater strictness. I remember the first time reading this passage as a kid and telling myself, Jesse, whatever you do, don't be a pastor. Worked out great. Whatever you do, just don't go into pastoral ministry. There are tons of jobs out there that you can take and still be a Christ follower. That is what the world is. That is what we need to be as people who are Christians. It's following Christ and showing people who he is regardless of what our job is. So I continue to tell myself, find anything except pastoral ministry. Because it is a terrifying thought to know that those who teach will be judged with a greater strictness. But for the exact reason that it scares me, I hope we know that that is the exact same reason that we need to pray. The exact same reason that makes this passage terrifying is the exact same reason why we need to be praying for our pastors. Because not only do they have a very important job, but it's a job they literally take on extra judgment to do. It is a job that in the eyes of God, God is saying, if you take this job, know that you will be judged more strictly because of it. Friends, this could literally be all of my message this morning, and this should be reason enough to pray more for our pastors. This burden alone, that every pastor has the ability and the, the given gift and ability from God to handle, this burden alone is enough for us to want and should and need to pray for our pastors. Because it shows how important the leaders and shepherds are of the church. And what I want us to get from James chapter 3, verse 1, is I want us to know that, friends, if there are men who are willing to subject themselves to extra judgment on our behalf, we can be a people who sacrifice extra time in the morning to pray for them on their behalf. If there are men in this world who are willing to accept the call of God and say, I will take on this extra judgment to teach, preach, and proclaim your gospel, then I think we as a congregation without a doubt can say, I can take extra time and pray for you this morning. I can take extra time and pray for your leadership and pray that God continues you in the path that you're on and pray that God continues to use you to accomplish his will and accomplish his purpose. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17 also backs up this exact same point. And I love this passage because it talks specifically to the congregation, to the pastor in its context. 13, verse 17 says this. It says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account, so that they may do this with joy, not groaning, for this would be unhelpful for you. Again, I love this particular passage because it talks about the role of leaders and the role of the congregation all in one passage. The beginning literally states, obey and submit to your leaders, obey and submit to your pastors so that they may do their job with joy. 
Now, I want to clarify, I'm not saying if a pastor steps down and a pastor quits, even from this church, and they say, man, my job was not joyful, the entire congregation should go home and shame themselves. That is not what I'm saying, and that's not what this particular passage is saying. But what I am saying is that if submitting and praying for your leaders makes you uncomfortable or forces you to feel independent or even makes you build up a wall and makes you say, I don't need a pastor and I don't need a leader over my life. Me and God are enough. Friends, the Bible would tell you that is a problem. If there's too much pride in your heart to be able to admit and to be able to say, I need someone to help lead me. I need someone to help mentor me. I need someone to help guide me. Friends, that is a problem that I pray God would help you fix. But the second reason I love this passage is not just because of what it says to the congregation. It's because of what it states right in the middle of verse 17. Because right in the middle of verse 17, it has a specific message for the pastor and for the leader and the shepherd of the church. And it says this. It says, For they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. They keep watch over over your souls as those who will give an account. Friends, I hope this morning you do not come to church because you love how the lights look inside the auditorium. Friends, I hope and pray this morning you don't come to church because you love that there is coffee served in the lobby when you walk through the doors. I hope and pray that the reason you don't even come to church is because you love the parking team that is out to greet you every morning. I'm not saying that that is a bad thing to love. I'm not saying that is a bad thing to be appreciated about. I encourage you, be appreciative of the things we have here at Avalon Church. But what I am saying is that I hope the reason you come to Avalon Church is because when you hear Richie preach, when you hear John preach, when you hear Justin preach, when you hear myself preach, you can look to the stage and go, now that is a man of God who I trust to keep watch over our souls. That is why I hope you come to Avalon Church. I hope you come to know that that is the reason, is that we would know that we are being led to show the congregation this is where God is leading your souls and this is where God is leading the church. So friends, the reason we should pray for our pastors is not so that they may lead and watch over a building, but that they may lead and watch over your souls. That is the job and responsibility of the pastor according to Hebrews 13 verse 17. I can tell you as a kid specifically, I was one of those people who was a church hopper as a kid, and I went to a youth ministry at one church, but Sunday mornings I went to another church. And it was very interesting to me because where I grew up, I went to a youth ministry at a church that was made of thousands and thousands of people. But my parents, they encouraged me and they encouraged our family, we're going to go to a church that is only made up of probably a hundred, a couple hundred at best. And I'll continue to ask my parents, why do we not just go to the church that we already go to for youth ministry on Wednesday nights, to a church that almost every other Christian in the community goes to, why do we go to this specific church and not to the one where most of our friends, most of our families, and mostly everyone else we know goes to? Why do we not go to that church on Sunday morning like everyone else? And I remember my parents looking at me one day and they had this conversation with me and they were saying, it's not that we are against what that church is doing, but what is important about a church is not the crowd, but why the crowd has gathered. What is important about a church is not how many people attend the building, it's why they attend that building. It's why they attend that service and it's why they attend that church service. And so my parents were telling me we would rather go to a church that we agree with, that preaches more soundly, who we know teaches the truth and teaches the gospel and only be made up of a hundred or so people rather than go to a church that is built up of thousands of people because they love the light show on a Sunday morning. And that taught me a lot growing up. I loved my parents who were able to do that to show me this is what matters about a church and this is what matters about a church family. It's not what the crowd attracts to. 
1 Timothy 4, 16 also backs up what Hebrews is talking about. And in this one, it's talked about specifically to the pastor. It says this. It says, pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. For those of you that don't know, First and Second Timothy are books strictly written for the pastor and for the leaders of the church. If you want to know what the church should look like in a modern day era and what the church should look like from a biblical perspective, read the book of Acts. If you want to know what it should look like from a leadership perspective from the top on down, read First and Second Timothy. Because it talks about from a leadership standpoint, this is how the church should be led. And this particular passage addresses pastors and shepherds of the church, the very people who lead the church. And as you can probably tell, this is a heavy burden for a man to bear. To literally hear, you will ensure salvation for both yourself and those who hear it based off of the message and gospel you preach on a Sunday morning. That is a big burden to bear. Don't get it twisted. I'm not saying that is a terrible burden for a man to bear. Praise God that God has been able to give someone a burden to be able to preach the gospel and preach the truth. Praise God for that. But that does not make that any less or smaller of a burden than we see in 1 Timothy. And I think there's no man who wraps this up more beautifully than Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon says in a quote, in one of my favorite quotes that I've read, he says this. He says, we are not responsible to God for the souls that are saved, but we are responsible for the gospel that is preached and for the way in which we preach it. Friends, like I said at the beginning, we are not responsible as pastors. We are not responsible as leaders and shepherds of the church for the people who are saved. We are not on the same tier as Jesus, and I pray that no one in this room would ever put a pastor on that same level. But friends, a pastor is on a different tier in the fact of that they have to teach and teach the gospel well and teach the gospel in truth because on that very message rest the message of salvation. And so friends, I want to encourage you again, pray for your pastor and the gospel they preach, not because their job depends on it, but because the message of salvation does. The message of salvation rests on every message and gospel-centered message that a pastor will give from the platform and from the stage of the church. And I can tell you that specifically as a kid growing up, as someone growing up in the church setting, it was a teacher and a pastor and a shepherd who led me to Christ. I'm not saying that kids' ministry is pointless. I believe it is absolutely crucial and vital. I'm not saying that youth ministry is pointless. I believe it is absolutely crucial and vital as well. But what I am saying is that at the end of the day, a man of God teaching the gospel led me to Christ and not Veggie Tales. Okay? Not bashing Veggie Tales at all. It's probably one of the best shows still on right now. But all that to say, it was a pastor and a man of God who was willing to subject themselves to the call of the Lord that was able to lead me to Christ. And so there's one last passage I want to share with you all this morning as we close, and one last passage that I want to share that I think is absolutely vital for us to understand as we close this message this morning. And that passage I want to share is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 25, and it says this, Brothers and sisters, pray for us. That's it. That's all Paul says as soon as he closes 1 Thessalonians. He says, Brothers and and sisters, pray for us. This is the third or fourth to last verse in the book of 1 Thessalonians, and the reason Paul was writing to the church in Thessalonica was because he was fixing and addressing all the problems the church was going through, everything that they needed help figuring out, and all the things that they wanted to know, this is how we need to fix it, and Paul is letting us know how we fix these issues. This church had many problems and many things that they needed Paul to address. And Paul addresses all of these issues. And before he closes the letter, before he closes his single letter, he doesn't say, may, may God bless you. May you be found in good health. May you have a better day tomorrow than you did today. He does address these things in this letter. 
but he closes out specifically saying, brothers and sisters, pray for us. Pray for us. And friends, I just want to say, this is or this should be the cry and heart cry of every pastor in America today. This should be the desire and the heart cry of every pastor who steps to the pulpit, who steps on stage every Sunday, is that they would have their congregation and they would be able to stand before everyone and say, brothers and sisters, pray for us. Pray for us as we lead this church. Pray for us as we lead this community. Pray for us as we raise up the next generation. Brothers and sisters, pray for us. And so I want to challenge everyone in this room this morning, pray for your pastors. Pray for your pastors. And not just once. Don't just pray for your pastors or make praying for your pastors a one-time thing. But friends, I want to encourage you, make praying for your pastors a daily practice. Make praying for your pastors and praying for the leaders and shepherds of the church a daily practice in your daily prayer and quiet times. Because we all, as Christ followers, rely on the leadership of our pastors. So it should not just be our job to pray for our pastors, but friends, it should be an honor to be able to pray for our pastors. Friends, it should be an honor to be able to wake up and say, God, I want to bring these people before you and I want to pray for them specifically this morning for the burden, the job, and the call that you have placed on their life to lead not just themselves and their family, but the community and the entire congregation as well. And so I want to give all of us the ability and the opportunity to do that this morning. And so this morning as we close, I would like to have Richie, John, and Justin just come to the front of the stage. And we are going to be given the opportunity to pray for the pastors this morning. And I'm going to step down and I will join them as well. But what this is going to look like is I've asked a a couple of our elders to be able to pray over our pastors this morning. And so Ken and Larry are going to be on either side of the pastors this morning, and I want to encourage them to be praying for our pastors this morning. But what I want to encourage everyone else in the room, I want to encourage all of us to stand on up this morning as we close, as we enter into a time of prayer. And I'll encourage everyone in this room this morning to be praying for your pastors as well. And so in a minute, I know there's not going to be that many people who may not be able to come forward, but I do want to give the opportunity and say I want to encourage everyone who can come down, make your way down the aisle, make your way to the front, and pray for our pastors as well. I'm not saying everyone needs to be laying on of hands, but we can do that this morning, and I would encourage you to come to the front and do that with our pastors this morning. And so if you need to stay seated, if you need to stay in your seat, again, I encourage you to reach out. Keep praying, pray for your pastors, and join with us in prayer this morning. But if not, I want to encourage all of you, go ahead and make your way on down, make your way on up right now, and be praying with our elders and praying with our congregation for our pastors. So with that, I will hand it out over to Larry Potter. here are all protected from the evil one. Because like it was said to you this morning, they need it. They need it. Because they're they're being hit from all sides. So we we pray that these leaders of our church are protected against the evil one. And on that note, we pray that our leaders our leaders of this church and this community, their vision is in line with what God wants them to relate to you, to teach to you. And believe me, that's, that's not easy. I admire them so much because of the job they do. Because it's a thankless job. I don't know whether you was paying attention, but they are judged. They are judged more strictly than anybody in this world. So we pray for them. That God 
is the true judge and he will take care of them. We pray that they receive wisdom, wisdom from God and impart that wisdom on to you. We pray that they have discernment because so many things come their way that they have to make decisions on. Not just about church, but in their advice to us. And something else we pray for. We pray for their families because if the devil can't attack them, he will attack their family. He will. I don't know whether you, you follow people's lives, but I don't know if you ever notice it, but pastor's children are the one that gives them the most heartaches. And that's because the devil will work on them. So we pray, we pray for their family. And I'm going to end this up because, you know, I know y'all want to get out of here. And I'll pass this on to my brother Ken. We pray that they will be in this world to lead us, but they will not be of this world. So we ask God to bless them and protect them. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Father God, we thank you for, for these pastors, Lord. We thank you for sending them to us. Father, we thank you for the leadership that, that we receive from them. Father, we ask that you will strengthen them, guard their hearts, and give them wisdom, Lord, as they lead us. Lord, be with their families. Lord, just put your loving, protecting arms around these families and guard them. And Father, we ask that you be with this congregation, Lord, that, that we be like Aaron and her holding up Moses' arms. Lord, support our pastors. We ask that, that this congregation gather around them and love them and lift them up to you on a daily basis, Lord. For all this we ask in Jesus' name, and the congregation said, Amen. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.